praise team because that uh, the video to the songs everything gears toward what we're talking about this morning and that is running the race Philippians chapter 3 while you're turning let me remind you of a couple of things one I was just told over here that uh, now listen we had a bunch of folks go through our membership class last week and you know part of the process then is to to just meet with some of our deacons to make sure the pastor did his job make sure folks are saved and baptized and and uh, Sean and Darlene I Ken Lopez said that he already met with you all so uh, right down here we've got two folks that are joining becoming part of of our church family. So let's welcome them real quick. Sean and Darlene Turner, the Turner family. And then, um, to, let's see, this Wednesday, I don't know, I didn't hear him. He may have said something, but uh, Pastor Robert is leading us on Wednesday night in a night of worship. So this Wednesday, uh, the other classes and all, we're gathering together and here, our children, our teenagers having a, a time of family worship. So it's just going to be a great time. So I would encourage you to be here Wednesday night, 645. And then I've got big news today. I told you that last week. You remember that? Got some big news. Now, if you were in the first service, you would have probably thought that the big news that were two of my grandchildren were here, and I brought one of them up here, just had to, had to show them off. But uh, anyway, that wasn't really the big news. You want to know what it is? Yeah. You got to wait till the end of the service. I don't want you leaving early, so we'll tell you at the end of the service. But next week, there's more big news. Reg, is it, it's big news next week, isn't it? It really is. It really is. In fact, it has to do with missions next week, and you're not going to believe uh, th this is as exciting as it gets as a church family. So I'm going to give you good news today. It's big news. Next week, I'm going to give you even more big news. So uh, you got to be here then too. Philippians chapter 3, let's stand together. We're going to read Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12 down to verse 16. It says this, not that I have already attained or am already perfected. But I press on, that I may lay hold on that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if any of anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Let's pray together. God, we just pray that you would bless the reading of your word, that you would open our hearts, open our minds to receive what you have for each one of us individually and then also corporately today. God, we see these writings of the Apostle Paul and know that they applied then, but God, they are so applicable to today. So I pray that we would hear from you, that your Holy Spirit would move in our hearts, that we would walk out of this building today different than we walked in. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a seat if you would. We're going to start there in Philippians chapter 3, work our way right through those verses today. And the Apostle Paul talked a lot about athletic competition. And so today we're going to we've titled today's message Joy Comes When We Run to Win. We've been talking each week about how do we find joy? We're looking at the epistle of joy, this letter of joy, and so we're finding out how do we find this joy? What well, comes when we run to win? And we know the Apostle Paul was competitive. I shared a couple weeks ago, I know many of you are competitive, uh, very competitive. In fact, we mentioned, and you'll hear more about it at the end, but we're having a, a church fellowship pumpkin carving time just for our church family to get to know one another, enjoy one another, just, just hang out together. Well, it's already turning into a competition. Reg, two of your friends, after the service, said there's a competition on this fellowship event. I think there might even be a trophy involved now, but uh, you can probably guess who the two are, but they, they're already at each other on carving a pumpkin. So the Apostle Paul loved competition too. In 1 Corinthians 9.24, he said this, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize. He said, so run that you may obtain. We talked about that verse uh, recently. And that verse, the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, don't run haphazardly. Don't just kind of meander through this. He is saying absolutely 100% run. Run with the intention of winning. Don't jog 
run, sprint, all the way to the end, cross the finish line. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. We as believers, man, we can become satisfied. We can just become kind of somewhat walking or mediocre in our our walk. I, I want to encourage you this morning to give it everything you've got. How many of you remember the name Lindsay Jacobellis? You will all remember her. When I, when, if you were around then, some of you may not have been around then, but in 2006, the Winter Olympics, they had the snowboard cross the, um, the debut of that, that event. There was a girl that was leading by so much, man, she was about to cross the finish line, there wasn't even anybody in a close second. So she starts doing a few hot dog moves, and when she did, if you remember, she went down, she fell And the other girl that was not even close to her ended up passing her and won the gold medal. You met now, how many of you remember that? You remember seeing some of the highlights and all that? Man, I should have shown the video for those that missed it. It is like a classic. This girl had it sewn up. I mean, you train every day, hours a day for those four years and probably even before. And she has the end in that end line in sight. And she messes around, and she didn't finish the race in first. She still won second. She was that far ahead that even after a fall, she still came in second place, got the the silver medal. And the Apostle Paul challenges us that the same thing that can happen with that event can happen in our spiritual lives, in your spiritual journey. Let me just tell you this morning. I want to give you good news, but I'm going to be honest with you this morning too. You are going to fall somewhere along the way. You are going to feel that you get tripped up, you get betrayed, you're going to be disappointed. Things are going to happen, and you're going to fall flat, and you're going to think, I'll never make it to the finish line. And I want to encourage you this morning that everybody that gets up still has that opportunity. And the Apostle Paul is saying, press on, press on. You're going to keep hearing that word this morning, press, press, press. So when you fall, and some of you have already fallen, you get to the point this morning, you're going to think, how, how can I ever please God? I'm always going to have God's second best because I made mistakes and I can never attain his best. And I'm going to tell you this morning that all God wants to give you is his best. People misquote some of the scripture that talks about God's good, acceptable, and his perfect will. I've heard preachers preach that those are three different wills, and I'm telling you that those are just adjectives describing God's will in general. He doesn't have three wills. Well, if you don't qualify for best, I'll give you good. (laughs) That is the most insane thing to think that God even has that type of an approach. Everything that God wants to send your way is best. His will is always best. There's nothing less. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16, the Apostle Paul is talking about that finish line. When you fall in and you're getting back up, or when you're like Lindsay and you stay on your, on your board and you're going for the finish line, if you're running, you're, get, running, you're giving it everything you've got going to the finish line. The Apostle Paul says, I've learned five things along the way. As I'm running to win, I've learned five things. Hopefully you picked up one of the sheets out there this morning. If you didn't, feel free to, to make your way to the lobby and grab one. But if you're following along in the outline, I'm going to give you those five things. We're going to fill them in. And the first one is this. In running to win, we must realize we are not perfect. We're not perfect. In fact, look here in our text, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. The Apostle Paul says this, not, and that is a huge word, make sure you hear it, not, N-O-T, that I have already attained or am already perfected. He says, I haven't attained, I haven't achieved it, and I am not perfect, but I press on, that I may lay hold of that which for Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. And we talked about it last week. You remember the Apostle Paul was running through there and he was giving his uh, credentials. And people were saying, oh, I'm a terrible sinner. Oh, I'm a terrible sinner. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, listen, you don't hold a candle to me. I did this, 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 this. And he goes through that whole list. And wow, in the end, can you imagine being in the room as he's going through his list and you sit back and go, wow, I'm really not that bad. You really were bad. You're terrible. And the Apostle Paul is saying, Listen, I know what Christ saved me from. I am not perfect. That's what we have to understand first. When we're going to run the spiritual race, we have to understand we're not perfect. There was only one perfect man, and he was crucified. The world didn't like him at all. 
So nowhere does Paul tell us to aim for perfection. Not one time will you read in any of his letters where he says try to be perfect. Instead, he says run for progress. We don't aim for perfection. We aim for progress. We keep growing in our faith. The Bible talks about going from the milk of the word to the meat of the word. Children want milk. We have my daughters visiting with us, and, and one has two daughters, one of them six months old today. She wants milk. She's not asking for steak. She wants milk. As the Bible says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk, give them what they need to grow. Now, if she hits 40 years old and she's still sucking her thumb, we have a serious problem. <laughs> we have expectations as people grow physically. We have expectations. You don't see people at our age, some of the older folks in the room that are crawling. You would say, no, something's wrong. We should have learned to walk by the time we're teenagers. You don't watch the, the teenagers crawling along the floor. Sometimes you do, I guess, but, but not all the time, right? So as we get to this point, when we see people that are mature in their faith that should be eating the meat of the word, man, if they're still drinking the milk of the word, something's wrong. Just like that physical thumb ought to come out of the mouth, spiritually, we ought to be able to digest something a little bit stronger, a little bit deeper, growing a little bit more. We should never get to the point where we're satisfied and say, that's far enough. I'm happy. I can crawl. I don't need to walk. That, that's satisfaction. And the Apostle Paul says, don't ever get to the point that you're satisfied because all satisfaction is is this. You're comparing yourself to somebody else and you're saying, based on where they are in their spiritual walk, I feel like I'm doing pretty good. So I'm just going to stop right here because I'm doing enough. But in 2 Corinthians, remember he writes to the church at Corinth and he says this, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. He said, when we get to the point that our spiritual satisfaction is just simply based on how we compare ourselves to others and we think we're doing better than they are, then, then we are really in a bad spot. We ought to always compare ourselves to Christ to see what he's asking of us, to see what the Bible teaches about what a mature believer ought to be doing and what a mature believer ought to be thinking, what a mature believer ought to be saying. And he just goes on and on, and the Apostle Paul says, hey, here's what I'm learning. Step one, here's the first thing I realized. If I'm going to run this race and I'm going to cross the finish line and I'm pressing toward that mark for that prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, i got to realize I'm not perfect. And he goes on. The second thing he says is, I can't get stuck. I understand I'm not perfect, but I, I, I can't be stuck either. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, so who's he writing to? Other believers, he's writing to the church at Philippi. He's not writing to the people out in the world. He's writing to the church. He said, brethren, those who are following Jesus Christ, you've accepted him as Savior. You believe he is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. You guys. He says, I do not count myself to have apprehended. So don't for a second think that I've, I've made it. Not one second because I know how, fall, how short I fall. He said, but this one thing I do. And I love it. If, if I could just give you one thing today. So the Apostle Paul says, if you don't hear anything else, I'm giving you this one thing. Forgetting those things that are behind. It's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. People get stuck. People get stuck. Man, we just can't forgive. We can't let it go. We can't, we can't forgive. We live in a world where people hold grudges. They look for opportunities to retaliate. All they want is vengeance. I don't know if you guys are watching some of the craziness that's going on in our world right now. I just had to laugh the other day when uh, Dan Feinstein goes over and hugs Lindsey Graham, and now people want her job. You know, you got, oh, now we have to get rid of you. You've just polluted yourself. And it gets to this crazy point to where people don't want to forgive. All people want is your head on a platter. They want your job taken away from you. They want you to suffer. That's the world we live in. And the Apostle Paul says, hey, I don't want to go that far. But guys, you can't get stuck. He says this. One, some of you are stuck because you can't forgive yourselves. You've done something. There's been a mistake in your past, and you're stuck. And I want to encourage you this morning. We all make mistakes. I already shared with you there's only been one perfect man 
you fall, you make mistakes, you'll be disappointed, you'll disappoint yourself. You're going to, some make mistakes, some you're going to make bad choices. We, we do that. We make a bad choice. We want a mulligan. We want a do-over. We, and God gives those. He's the God of the second chance. And you look back in Scripture and you'll find those times where God didn't write somebody off. God said, I accept that repentance. He's restored them. Somebody in here today needs to hear that. You've blown it. You've messed up. You've fallen. You've fallen short. And you're feeling like God can't use me. And I'm telling you, God can use you. He can make you a trophy of his grace. One day he can actually hold you up to the point that he could say, look at this person. Look at David. How would you like to have your sin recorded in Scripture and have it written down that you had an affair? (laughs) That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Yeah, we all want that. No, but that's what happened to him. He wrote it down there. And then in the same book that he wrote down and said, David, I'm calling you out and I'm writing it down for everybody to read. He goes on and A little later, he says, he's a man after my own heart. You don't think that made David just tear up? Stop and think for a minute. Those that sin the worst are the ones that appreciate forgiveness the most. And in that case, I can just imagine David. But Satan uses this guilt. See, if David in his mind allowed Satan to have his way, he would have made him feel so guilty that David never could have done anything for God. But the Holy Spirit brings conviction. Guilt is like being stuck in quicksand, and you are sinking slow and steady. Conviction is what the Holy Spirit brings, and the conviction causes us to want to be right with God, so we make the adjustments in our life. That's the difference between conviction and guilt. God never makes us feel guilty. Satan brings guilt. God, through his Holy Spirit, brings conviction that causes us not to feel worthless, that causes us to have a desire for repentance, to be right with God. That's where some people get stuck. Some people get stuck in uh, not being able to forgive others. First one was, sometimes we don't forgive ourselves, but sometimes we don't forgive others either. So Ephesians, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. In verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 32, he says, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Listen to this. Even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. That is just a powerful, powerful, powerful verse. I heard somebody this past week, I was listening to the radio, I don't even remember who it was. But they made this statement. You will never truly understand what it means to forgive others until you realize of what God forgave you. That's powerful. We will never, ever be able to forgive others until we really understand what God forgave us of. Because there's nothing that anybody could ever do to us that ever measures what we have done to a holy God. And yet he still extends forgiveness to us. So some people get stuck because they can't forgive themselves. Some people get stuck because they won't forgive others. Some just allow bitterness to take root in their heart. And the Bible talks about that too. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 15 said this, Looking carefully means examining ourselves. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springs up and cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Bitterness is one of the absolute worst things that can ever happen in your life. You say, how do I know if I'm bitter? It's really simple. Is there anybody that just came to your mind that you wish something evil happened to them? Think about it this morning. If you heard that someone that you know that something good happened to them and it would cause you pain, then you're bitter. If you can't rejoice when something good happens to somebody else and you think, Why did God let that happen? Why did he give them that? I wish he would. You're bitter. Bitterness, somebody described it as preparing a cup of poison so that you can present it to someone else and take their life, and instead you choose to drink from that cup of poison yourself. That's bitterness. You're dying from the inside out. Bitterness is like being locked in a cage, and that cage, every bar has somebody else's name on it. And every time you think about life in general, you are grabbing on and all you see is that person in front of you and it is driving you crazy and they've moved on. Man, they are so, so far gone and past you. They're not worried about it anymore. Bitterness, when it takes root in the heart of an individual, can absolutely destroy them. Paul says you've got to have a biblical perspective of forgiving and forgetting. 
Jeremiah 31. Listen to this, verse 34. God said, I will forgive their iniquity. I will remember their sin no more. So let me give you the, the best news here today. Let me ask you first a question. When the Bible says, a statement like this, that I, God said, I will remember their sin no more. Does that mean that God forgot it? I mean, he just really doesn't even think about it and remember it anymore? He's omniscient. It's a trick question, right? He's omniscient. He knows everything. He doesn't forget anything. So how is it, this must be one of those, those times in the Bible where it's not accurate, right? See, all these inaccuracies people talk about, it's just a misunderstanding. When the Bible says that God said, I will remember their sin no more, how can he be omniscient and not remember? Because here's the real definition of forgiveness. You'll never be able to forgive and forget. Whoever came up with that statement, that was one of the dumbest statements that ever could have been made. Forgive and forget. You will always remember when somebody has done you wrong or harmed you. You're going to remember it. God remembers that sense or could because he's omniscient, but here's the difference. He chooses not to bring it up again. An omniscient God has the knowledge of what took place, but his forgiveness says, I will never bring it up again. That's true forgiveness. We can do that, but it's a choice that we have to make. In the ancient world, it's interesting, I came across this illustration this week, it's so good. The term forgetting, here we are talking about a race, the Apostle Paul talking about running the race and pressing on. The reference refers to this, forgetting was used to, to, to uh, state about a runner passing another runner and not looking back. Think about that a minute, you're in a race, you pass them, you don't ever turn around and look backwards. Forgetting was, when I pass that guy, I'm keeping my eyes on the finish line. That's forgetting. That's the idea of us, instead of looking in the rearview mirror and remembering all of our shortcomings and our failures, it's so easy for us to remember these things, because we're not perfect. Let me ask you, those of you that have ever played sports, you can have the best game of your life, and you make one mistake. What do you remember? You miss you remember the shot you missed, the free point, the free, the, the free throw you missed. You remember the shot on goal that, that you missed. You remember as a college kicker last night missing the field goal that would have won the game. You remember those things, even though it may not turn out bad. You know what happens to me? I'll preach twice on Sunday morning. Man, I'll go through the sermon. If I say one thing wrong or leave out a point, you know what I think about all Sunday afternoon? Man, I should have. Hey, It happens. We all get that, to this point where we just look backwards and the Apostle Paul is saying, hey, forgetting is passing that and keeping your eyes on the goal. Don't look side to side. It's like blinders. Warren Wearsby said it this way. The unsaved person is controlled by the past, but the Christian running the race looks toward the future. He also said this. The believer should be future-oriented, forgetting those things which are behind, breaking the power of the past, by living for the future. Again, somebody in here needs to hear that. You are wrapped up in the past, and you are not allowing God to do what he wants to do with you in the future because you're trapped in yesterday. Man, let go. The story of Joseph is such a great illustration. His brothers sell him into slavery. He's forgotten in a, in a dungeon. And a guy that could have got bitter at God, instead he just says, hey, yeah, I've been mistreated. Yes, these things have gone wrong, but I trust my God. And the day comes that through his suffering, an entire nation is saved. That's the difference of letting go of the past and looking on to the future. And that's what Paul's saying. Forget the past. Extend forgiveness. Press toward the prize. Become more like Jesus. Here's the third thing. He says, if I'm going to win this race, he says, I have to realize it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be easy. Look at verse 13, starting in the middle of the verse. It says this, Reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. This idea of becoming satisfied that we talked about earlier, and you can't get satisfied. You've got to keep pushing forward. We can't rest on yesterday's wins. We have to keep going out and looking forward. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm an avid Dolphin fan, struggling a little bit this year, <laughs> but I'm a Dolphin fan. Do I always refer back to the perfect season? Yes, all Dolphin fans do. <laughs> all right. But that was yesterday's news. 
We have to start looking forward to the future. The same is true in our spiritual walk. We can't look back at yesterday. So when you start looking back, the, uh, I, I love this. Let me just give you this other illustration. Keep moving here. I read about this this week, too, and it was so good, how that they gave the illustration of a chariot. And with that chariot, that, uh, that when they would go into battle, there was a small platform, and the chariot driver would stand on that platform, and he would lean up against the front of the, the carriage. And as he was leaning at the front of the chariot and driving those horses, he was pressing on. That's the idea of being engaged in the battle, being driven and pressing forward. That's what was talking about when we're winning. It's got to be that passion, that intensity. You can't be pressing forward if he's leaning back and pulling on those reins. He had to be pressing forward. That's what the Apostle Paul is talking about, pressing toward that prize. He never encouraged comfortable Christianity or convenient Christianity. He said, no way, I'm pressing, I'm pressing, 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 pressing. That's what he's emphasizing. The fourth thing he said, not only is it not going to be easy, he said, we can't waver. If I'm going to cross the finish line and I'm going to finish the race, I can't waver. Look at verse 15. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. He's saying, the, what kind of mind? The mindset of commitment. That's what he's talking to the whole uh, church there at Philippi about. In fact, let's go back before we go forward. Who did he write to? Brethren. That's the church. Why was he writing? Go back to, to chapter 1. He said they're being, um, they're, they're being attacked from the outside. They're being persecuted. So he's saying, hang in there. Don't give up. This persecution that's coming, stand firm. Then they're fighting with each other, and he says, hey, knock it off. We're not fighting against the other. We have an adversary. Satan is the one. He's our opponent. He wants to see us go down. He's the enemy, like a roaring lion. Remember, we talked about I mean, he was ready. In his mind, he knew how many times he had to go around. He went and he bought the right clothes, and uh, he bought the right shoes, and so he was going to go down and run five miles. I think that first day, if I remember the story right, he ran about a half a mile, and he was done. That was it, because there was no training. It doesn't matter how we look on the outside. It doesn't matter if we have on all the right equipment or we bought the right shoes. You have to build up the endurance. You have to, have to get into a position to where you can finish this race. That takes commitment. And long story short, if I remember right, he wasn't very committed because I don't think he made the five-mile mark, did he, Steve? Never did make the five miles because of the lack of commitment. And here's another one. Spiritual maturity is going to take discipline. Watch the bodybuilders on TV, the strongmen stunts and all that stuff. Man, when they're having those competitions, these guys don't look like that overnight. I mean, you got to work all this off first before you can, you know, work all this in there. And these guys, it's, there's no magic pill you can swallow. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of commitment. It takes getting up early in the morning every day, going and hitting the weights every day. It takes a discipline of what we eat. It takes a discipline of how much we exercise, how much we work out. And that's when you get the payoff. You can't just go to sleep and take some pill and, and look like that the next day. It doesn't work that way. He's saying you have to be committed. You have to have discipline. And if that's true in the physical life, then we have to have it in the spiritual life too. And the problem is that not everybody's committed. The Bible gives a lot of examples of people who started strong and then they fell by the wayside. The first one, Lot, Samson, Saul, Ananias, Sapphira, we saw all those. And then you see those who actually did finish strong, Moses and Joseph and Daniel and John Mark, just a few. Let me give you the last one. What's the Apostle Paul saying? Man, I'm not perfect. I can't do all this. He goes through the whole list. <sighs> Got to hang in there. Got to have some endurance. But here's what he said. This is the key. Look at verse 15. <clears throat> I love this because this is where he puts it all together. These other things are all on me. Man, I, it's going to be tough. It's not going to be easy. I, I can't waver. He says, but I'm not going to do it alone not going to do it alone. Look at verse 15. Just one phrase there. He says, therefore let us. Now go to verse 16. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. 
Let us be of the same mind. Do you see what he's saying there? Us, we, us, us, four times in just two verses. Four times. But if you go back to chapter 1, he said the same thing. You see those words, same mind? Remember he mentioned that multiple times in chapter 1? He mentions it multiple times in chapter 2. He mentions it again now in chapter 3. He's saying it's the same mind. It's our mind that has to be on the same page. What is the mind of the church? What is the mind of the body of Christ to please him? What's the mind of Christ? It's herein is the Father glorified that we bear much fruit, that we're bringing people to the gospel, that we're impacting others' lives for all of eternity. That's how we glorify God. And we do that together. When we come together on Sundays, man, we're encouraging one another. We should be getting to know one another. I had the opportunity to, to get to know two couples just in between the services, just hanging out a few minutes and, and just saying, who are you? Tell me about yourself. What do you do? I want to know about your kids. Just sharing our story a little bit. I, I want to know people. The Apostle Paul is saying the same thing. We gain strength by having the same mind. We as a body of believers, when we understand that we are here together as a team, that we are an army, in the first service, it's our more traditional, uh, a more classic service, we call it. Um, it, it. We sang, I'm in the Lord's army this morning. You remember that song? I may never. And you, you're doing all the motions with the kids. I was waiting for Pastor Robert to break out with all the motions this morning. Jennifer almost did. I watched. She was up here marching. But you remember those? We're an army. We forget that. Working together. You sports fan, why do you watch NASCAR, anybody? Come on, let's be honest. For the wrecks, absolutely. You watch it for the wrecks. Or good sleeping on Sunday afternoon. There's nothing better. It's like, ah. You watch it for the wrecks. I do too. But you know what we learn in NASCAR? That those cars can actually get right up on each other's bumper and they can draft and they're better together that when they're drafting off of one another they're actually faster they're working together they can accomplish more football is the same thing the running back makes his cut based on where the linemen make the hole they're better together if you just hand the running back the ball with no line he's not going very far they all work together Basketball is the same way. One of the biggest statistics they track are assists. Why? Because we're better together. The Apostle Paul knows that. So what he's doing is in this, this book, he is telling people, let's lock arms. Let's come together as the family of God. Let's have the same mind that we're trying to reach the world with the gospel. We realize it's not going to be easy. We realize that nobody's perfect. We realize that we can't waver. We can't relax, that we have to be committed. We realize all these things, but we realize that if we encourage one another, we're going to be so much better. What do coaches do? They come alongside of you. They encourage you. What do trainers do? They come alongside of you. They encourage you. Any of you that are involved in any kind of a, a sporting event where there's somebody coaching you, they're encouraging you. You can do it. One more, one more, one more, one more. A little bit harder, a little bit farther. Come on, you can do it. We need some spiritual spotters in the church. Some guys in the church that will come along that other, next to that young dad and say, hey man, fathering, it's one of the greatest things in the world. It's also one of the most frustrating you'll ever take on. One of those guys that will come alongside that young guy that just got married and say, hey buddy, you just entered a whole new world. <laughs> come on. It's people that can come alongside one another and say, for the gospel's sake, man, we can hold each other up. That's what the Apostle Paul's saying. So let me wrap it up here. You know what he says? And some of my favorite verses are right here in, in this chapter. Brethren, hey, body of Christ, I count not myself to have apprehended. I haven't arrived. But this one thing I do. Forgetting the things that are behind. Have you blown it sometime in your life? Have you messed up? Made some mistakes this week. You say, how can God love me through this? The Apostle Paul says, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth, stretching forth, pressing on. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's what he's saying. So let me ask you this morning. 
There's two people and two types of people in the room this morning. Either number one, this makes no sense to you. You're not part of God's family. It just you're still kind of examining. You're listening, but but you're finally starting to get it. Here's the bottom line: the Apostle Paul was one of the greatest sinners of all time, but he found a God of the second chance, God who loved him in spite of his mess. A God who said that in spite of your failures, I love you more than you can ever imagine. And Saul came to him, and he became Paul, and his life was changed. You might need that this morning. You don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You don't understand what it means to be a a Christian. To you, that's just a title. It doesn't actually mean a follower of Jesus Christ, but that's, that's what the Bible speaks of. If that's you this morning and you need to start a relationship with Jesus Christ, man, I'd love to help you do that today. It's as simple as confessing our sin and inviting Christ into our life. There's another group of people in here this morning. You're believers, but you've been satisfied. The Apostle Paul said, don't ever get satisfied. It's not enough. We want to press toward the mark. And this morning, you need to start leaning up on the front of that chariot again. You need to start pressing You need to start moving forward for the cause of Christ. You say, well, how do I know if that's me? Was there ever a day that you were more excited about the Lord than you are today? Was there ever a day you told more people about Christ than you tell today? Was there a day where you read the scriptures more than you're reading them today? And if that be the case, that there was a time where we were closer to God before than we are today, then we need to move on up and start pressing again, pressing close to him. Aiming for the finish line. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't be Lindsay Jacobellis who starts hot dogging and saying, I got this wrapped up. Every one of us needs to have the blinders on and the eyes focused on the finish line because we want to hear one day, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Man, we live in a world that's a mess. And we live in a world where people are so distracted by all the stuff. I want you to leave here this morning with the words of the Apostle Paul saying, I'm pressed toward the mark or the goal of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That this week, man, we stay focused. We don't look at the distractions. All we want is a little bit more of Jesus. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute? We have not been giving public invitations because of the pandemic and all that. But in your seat, if you don't know Christ this morning, let me tell you this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I love this word. It says that whosoever or whoever, that doesn't exclude anyone. For whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. If that's you this morning and you've never called out on Jesus Christ to save you, pray something like this. This is between you and God, not magic words, and don't even pray them out loud. Nobody needs to know this except you and the Lord. But just say, dear God, this morning I admit that I'm, I've done wrong. And the Bible calls that sin. I understand that you as a holy God cannot allow a sinful person into heaven. But through Jesus Christ and the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary, that blood paid the penalty for my sin. And so today, the best way that I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me for the wrongs that I've done. And today, I want to invite Jesus into my life to be my Lord and to be my Savior. If that's you and you prayed that this morning, welcome to the family of God. Others this morning, you say, man, I've been on the sidelines. Preacher, I'm so discouraged. I failed in my finances, maybe family issues, maybe in a business. I've made some bad choices, poor decisions, and I'm struggling with this thing called guilt. I mean, I want to encourage you right there in your seat right now. Recognize it for what it is and understand that God doesn't send guilt, as I mentioned The Holy Spirit brings conviction. If there's something that needs to change, you pray right there in your seat and say, God, help me to do the right things, things that are pleasing to you. Forgive me where I failed. And if it's guilt and you're not forgiving yourself, then ask him for that grace to be able to do that today. 
If you're here and when I spoke of bitterness, somebody comes to your mind and you are hanging on, ask him today to set you free from the bondage of that bitterness. Father, this morning, the Apostle Paul's words can be taken so many different ways for this group. He was encouraging believers. He called them brethren. So for those that are in the room this morning that are not yet part of the family of God, or those that just recently prayed, Lord, I pray they'd have an understanding of what that means to have a family with you as our Father. God, for those that are in the room this morning that have been satisfied, or maybe they've given up, maybe they're lacking commitment, they're no longer pressing on, Lord, those that have wavered a little bit, those that are on the sidelines, Lord, I just pray that this morning they would realize that you're the God of forgiveness. You called David a man after your own heart, even after he had had such a terrible failure, because you restore us, you make us new. So God, I pray this morning that as we walk out of these doors, that people will find Christ as Savior and their life is different this week. I pray for those that walked in here in bondage, that they'd be set free. I pray for those that are in this place that are just struggling uh, with complacency, that they would be made alive, that they would understand how important it is that they press on to know you more and to grow in their faith. But God, I pray that we walk out of this place different this morning than we walked in. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.